It's certainly a pleasure to welcome you all this morning, my time, afternoon and evening in other time zones. Once again, I'm Dr. Julia Chaloner from the USA. We're here to discuss the diagnosis and referral of retinoblastoma as part of the PSYOP Childhood Cancer Early Diagnosis and Appropriate Referral Program, we refer to as CEDAR. I'm joined by my joint co-moderators, Dr. Aaron Peckham Gregory from the US and Dr. Feza Derendelile from Turkey. This project, a collaboration with IPA, aims to improve the knowledge and understanding of general healthcare providers about the initial care of pediatric patients suspected of having cancer. Today, we hear practical advice from oncology experts from around the world on how to identify children with a suspicion of retinoblastoma at the earliest possible stage. I'm going to go back one slide because I neglected to mention the biographies for Dr. Peckham Gregory and Dr. Darren Delilier. Dr. Aaron is a PSYOP Education and Training Committee member and Assistant Professor of Pediatrics in Hematology Oncology at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas. And Dr. Faza is our representative from the International Pediatric Association and faculty member of the Istanbul University, Istanbul Medical Faculty in Pediatric Endocrinology in Turkey. We're going to have today a start with a case scenario presented by Dr. Alexander Lloyd Ying from the Philippines. Then we move to a talk on when to suspect retinoblastoma by Dr. Clarissa Matosino from Brazil. Next, we'll hear a talk on approach for diagnosis, initial management, and referral from Dr. Swathi Kaliki from India. And then we'll have a panel. The panelists will include Dr. Guillermo Chantada from Uruguay, Dr. Regine Kabuti, Turkey, Dr. Francois Doz from France, and Dr. Sandra Safieri from Australia. And you will hear their biographies when we get to the panel. We do this morning have simultaneous Spanish translation. If you have questions, you can kick, click on the question Q&A at any point at the bottom of your screen and type your question. Unfortunately, there's no voice option for the audience. Text answers will come from the experts if possible in the Q&A. And if we run late and you would like someone to get back to you with an answer to your question, please type your email in the Q&A with your question. We will have a dedicated discussion of the questions and answers you've placed after the panel discussion so that the appropriate professional can answer your question. Continuing medical education credits are available and they will come from the PSYOP office once you have completed an evaluation. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Lloyd Ning, a fellow in pediatric hematology oncology at the Philippines General Hospital in Manila, Philippines representing SIOP Global Health Network, Young, Low and Middle Income Countries Working Group. Dr. Ning, please go ahead. We're expecting <clears throat> that you will see a video. We are launching the video of Dr. Ning's presentation of a case scenario. Good day. I'm Alexander Lloyd Nang, fellow of pediatric hematology and oncology from the Philippine General Hospital, and I'll be presenting a case of retinoblastoma with a delayed diagnosis. This is a case of a 30-month-old male with a chief complaint of white discoloration of the right eye. Five months prior to consultation, patient was noted to have whitish discoloration of the right pupil, mostly seen when playing outside. This time, the parents thought it was normal and did not seek any consultation. In the interim, the whitish discoloration became more prominent and more frequently visible. Three months prior to consultation, the patient developed redness of the right eye and periorbital swelling. They sought consult with a general physician where a physical examination without ophthalmoscopy was done. Assessment was an eye infection given antibiotic eye drops and advised follow-up after seven days. There was no improvement of symptoms, but because of lack of funds, the patient did not follow up. The swelling progressed with development of tearing and protrusion of the right eye. Again, no consultation was done due to financial constraints. Five days prior to consultation, after a delay of five months, they went to a private ophthalmologist 
who assessed the patient as retinoblastoma and was referred to our institution. Before this illness, the patient did not have any regular checkup with the pediatrician. Immunization is incomplete. Highest educational attainment for both parents is elementary school. Both are unemployed. Upon physical examination, grossly the right eye has chemosis, lag of thalmus, and proptosis. There was no vision in the right eye. The left eye is normal. Cranial CT showed the large mass occupying the entire eyeball with extraocular extension into the middle, lateral, and superior right eye muscles. There is enhancement and thickening of the middle to distal segments of the right optic nerve. Staging workup showed normal CSF with no tumor cells. The bone marrow biopsy and CBC are normal. The patient was diagnosed with IRS as stage 3 retinoblastoma. The plan for the patient is neoadjuvant chemotherapy with vincristine, cyclophosphamide, cisplatin, and etoposide. This is followed by inoculation, chemotherapy, and external beam radiation. It is unfortunate that this child was diagnosed late. If the patient was diagnosed with retinoblastoma five months ago and referred to a center of excellence that also provides free treatment and housing, saving the child's life would have not required intensive therapy. We might have also had the chance to save the patient's eye and vision. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Clarissa Matasenor. Uh, Dr. Matasenor is an ophthalmologist and head of the ocular oncology sector at the National Institute of Cancer in Rio, Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. Uh, Dr. Matasenor will be sharing with us when to suspect retinoblastoma. Uh, Dr. Matasenor, please begin. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'd like to thank you for this invitation. It is a great pleasure and honor to uh, speak with the greatest names in retinoblastoma. So I will start sharing my video, my, my screen. Well, let's go the, the first one. So I was telling you that I, I interview personally uh, each mother or father of our patients. And um, those were the answers that they, they the first signs they, they, they saw in the children. So you can see that leukocoria and strabismum, uh, it's uh, almost 100% of the cases, but uh, it's more than 100% because some some cases they 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 said that they uh, the child had more than one sign or symptom, and most of the cases with uh, two or more signs were local chorea plus something else. So I will start. Uh, um, you can move on, please. Leukocoria, it's the, the white reflection in the pupil. Uh, initially, it is inconstant, and that's uh, very important to, to remember because it's not easy to see uh, initially the leukocoria because it depends on the way the light reflects on the retina. So uh, it is common that the mother said that uh, they saw it, but no, nobody else saw and. And that's why that's when they start uh, losing time because they even showed that to the practitioner or pediatrician and they didn't see it because uh, it was still a small leukocoria. Um, and leukocoria can also be seen uh, in flash photography. So like I was saying, leukocoria and strabismo, it's a common association. Strabismo is caused when the, the child loses uh, cent central fixation or uh, central vision. So, uh, and strabismo is also a problem because I, I don't know uh, if it's a reality in all the countries, but here in Brazil, it's very common to hear from pediatrics and general practitioners that strabismo is normal in small children. So that was also uh, something that I heard a lot in those interviews. They said that they 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 showed they they went to the doctor with the strabismus and they said no come back in a few years it will goes away. So uh, we we are now trying to help pediatricians and practitioners not to use that uh, that kind of uh, dismissal of the complaint. So uh, strabismus may also be not uh, constant in the beginning of the retinoblastoma. 
it is caused by it, it causes uh, impairment of the vision it's often overlooked by practitioner and it always justify an ophthalmological cons consultation with founders examination you cannot uh, treat any kind of strabismus without founders examination so this is um, also a buf this is a bufthalmia uh, we have a lot of cases that uh, the first sign is bophthalmia. It's when the, 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 the child has a big tumor that causes uh, high intraocular pressure and the eye uh, grows. That's a problem because that's also um, a sign of congenital glaucoma. So we have children that are treated for months for uh, congenital glaucoma, but uh, in fact, it was retinoblastoma. This one, uh, orbital cellulite, it's also a, a, a form of first sign of retinoblastoma in cases more advanced. This one is a child who was treated also for weeks for uh, pseudocellulitis with antibiotics before an image could be done and the uh, retinoblastoma diagnosis uh, perform. So I put here some uncommon, uh, uncommon first signs of retinoblastoma, like uh, iris forbiosis, which, which is also uh, a sign of uh, neovascular glaucoma, pseudo hypopion, hyphema, heterochromia. Those are not very common signs, like leukocoria and strabismus, but they also uh, can happen. So you have to pay attention. And those signs are more uh, diagnosed by ophthalmologists. It is hard uh, to, to do that kind of uh, diagnosis without um, our instruments. So this, those are more for uh, ophthalmologists. Heterochromia, like, like I was saying, I, I, I don't have any patients that, that I remember with this sign, but uh, it is related. So I put here uh, an article about that. PCL dipopium that uh, is a tumor in the anterior chamber. And sometimes it can be confused with uveitis or some other infections of the eye, but uh, it is in fact uh, retinoblastoma also. Next one. And this photo, uh, it's um, a child. She's uh, the daughter of this uh, very famous person here in the Brazilian TV. He is the host. He was the host of Big Brother for many years here in Brazil. So he's very known person, famous person. And his daughter was diagnosed uh, last year with retinoblastoma. And her first sign was nystagmus. She had a bilateral case with advanced disease. And um, this case, uh, I, I remember uh, Dr. Carlos Leal saying that uh, when uh, some famous or some something happened in the TV, the retinoblastoma became uh, uh, famous or um, in the media for uh, five minutes. And um, that's exactly what happens. What happened here? We had this uh, retinoblastoma year here in Brazil because of this child. And it helped us um, do a, a lot of early diagnosis because people are uh, more aware of the disease. But um, I'm afraid that, like Dr. Leal said, it's uh, only during like 15 minutes of fame. So, but uh, it's helping us now to put the retinoblastoma in, me in the media, talking about uh, red reflex text and uh, the other forms of diagnosis. So nystagmus is a saccadic, saccadic eye movement. The, usually is bilateral and uh, it's caused by low vision, so the child cannot fixate the eye. And it, it has to be done a different diagnosis with CNS diseases. And proptosis, unfortunately, that's still the case that uh, we have patients arriving with proptosis with central nervous system invasion, like those two. Those two patients were from a few years ago, but uh, we still do receive one or two patients with, with proptosis every year. And I'm afraid that the COVID-19 made it worse. We had uh, a lot of bufthalmia and proptosis, I think, caused by the, the pandemic.
So the screening for retinoblastoma is here in Brazil, and I think worldwide is uh, done with red reflex tags. And here, by the uh, federal law, it is done in all newborns before they leave the maternity. And, uh, but it's not uh, by law repeated in the other exams. So we, in those interviews, I, I heard a lot of mothers and, and, and fathers said that, but my, my child was screened, but the screening didn't go on in the other child care uh, consultations. So we, what we're not, we are now trying with the, the societies of uh, uh, pediatrics in here, and it, it is to, um, to, to have more red reflex tests during the, the child consultations. It is a, a very easy test to do with, without dilatation, with a direct ophthalmoscope. So it is hard. Um, it is hard to, it's not hard to implement that in the child consultation. So those are the, the results of the red uh, reflex test. You can have both eyes with the red reflex, it's okay. If you have leukocoria in one eye or both eyes, it's uh, an, an alert. You have to do a fundus uh, examination quickly. And also, if you, if you don't find the, the reflex, it is also an alarm. And then you have to do a fundus consultation. Next one, please. Photoleucocoria. I, I put here what I, I'm, I'm receiving every month uh, a photo in my cell phone. Someone asking me, look what I found in the picture of my child. And unfortunately, we cannot say it, if it's uh, something or it's not, if it's only an artifact. So, uh, uh, and we don't have protocols for photolecocoria yet here. So I always uh, recommend the founders uh, examination when you found a photo like that. And so uh, just to remember that photolecocoria this, this patient was dilated, so it's easy to see leukocoria when the child has this pupil dilated, but it's not easy otherwise. What I recommend is to do the tests uh, within a dark room or even take the picture in the dark room. It helps uh, to have a, a better photo. What, what, what else do you have to pay attention for the family history? Because when you have a history of retinoblastoma in the family, the screening and the, the serial fundus, fundoscopies are, of course, different than from general population. And I'd like to tell you quickly this uh, story of this family here. I put my, my, my dear friend Natalia Grigorovsky here because uh, she's my uh, op, uh, onco pediatric oncology and very dear friend uh, in retinoblastoma. She's um, work, she worked here at the National Institute of Cancer. And we were a few years ago reviewing some charts. And we saw that uh, the shot of this, this lady here, this um, young woman, she was treated in our center in the 19s. She had bilateral enucleation, uh, 21 cycles of chemo reduction. And, and radiotherapy in both orbits shows she had this uh, orbital defect. She had a here uh, a, a deafness and a mental uh, problem also caused by the chemo. So uh, we, you have to uh, do the, the, the protocol for family retinoblastoma, and that's not yet. Not, that's not the reality. Sometimes we still have uh, patients that the the parent had retinoblastoma, and they didn't know even why they was enucleated. So, uh, in the cases that they, that you know, you have to follow uh, very closely the child, like this one that as I was showing you, the results of the children. That we that we could say with both eyes was uh, intraterior was very different from his mom. That's what I was uh, wanting to say, and I'm sorry for the time uh, delay. So that's all, and uh, thank you. And uh, just if I have 20 seconds to do, read the take-home message, RNS is the word. Unfortunately, we don't have RNS translation in Portuguese, and so. 
that's an important word to remember in retinal blastoma. Do not undermine parents' observations and complaints about uh, leukocoria or strabismus. Photoleukocoria requires fundoscopy. Remember that 50% of leukocoria are retinal blastoma, as was said in this article uh, many, many years ago. So that's it, and I'm sorry for the delay. Thank you all. <clears throat> Thank you very much. So in this uh, part of the session of the meeting, it's uh, my pleasure to introduce Dr. Swati Haliki. And uh, the title is Approach for Diagnosis, Initial Management and uh, Referral. So Dr. Kaliki is the head of the ocular oncology service at the Operation Eyesight uh, Universal Institute for Eye Cancer. Uh, she is from Prasad Eye Institute, India. She is a well-known expert, has about uh, more than 230 articles uh, on this, uh, uh, in this field and participated in more than uh, 30 uh, chapters in books. So the floor is yours, uh, Dr. Kaliki. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Faiza. So I will uh, share the screen. First of all, thank Hello. you for inviting me to make the presentation. I hope you can see the full screen. So uh, I'll be talking to you over the next 15 minutes about the approach for diagnosis, initial management and referral. Uh, as introduced, I'm Dr. Swati Kaliki and I'm from India. I do not have any financial disclosures to make. Now I have uh, divided this uh, talk into three parts. Uh, first, the approach for diagnosis. Um, I think we have had a very good uh, previous talk about the importance of leukocoria. And whenever a child is detected with leukocoria or a white reflex, that's when the child gets referred uh, to an ophthalmology or an oncology service. But we should also remember that leukocoria is not always equal to retinoblastoma, though uh, more than 50% of the cases in children are retinoblastoma when the child has a white reflex. They can be because of tumors, because of congenital malformations, vascular diseases, inflammatory diseases, and trauma. Now, when a child comes to an ophthalmology center or an oncology center, the first thing that we have to do is, uh, is establish an accurate diagnosis. So as you can see the collage of pictures here, the, all these children were referred to my clinic with a differential or with a suspicion of retinoblastoma, and all of them had some form of white reflex, uh, some of them having very prominent and some of them having kind of very subtle uh, white reflex in the eye. So the first step is always to take a good history and do a basic clinical examination in the, in the clinic, which is always uh, not very easy, especially in children. But uh, the history can give clue to the diagnosis. Like for example, the first picture, the first child uh, had a history of uh, low birth weight and uh, premature birth. So that itself tells us that probably the leukocoria that the child has could be because of some other diagnosis. And the last picture that you're seeing, this uh, child had a history of trauma. So um, when we have to take the history, it becomes very important when there is a high suspicion of retinoblastoma. Like in these cases, these two cases are retinoblastoma. And um, uh, the family history especially has to be taken uh, because family history may be positive in 10% of the cases. So I'll just uh, share a short story of one of the child. So the second picture that you're seeing, that is the, the child who has unilateral leukocoria, he had a very significant uh, family history. This is the mother's uh, eyes, uh, where she said that her eye had become small when she was young. She did not know the reason, and she had never got an eye examination done. But when we did examination in the clinic, obviously her eye, one eye was thysical and the other eye had a tumor which had spontaneously regressed, what we call as retinocytoma. So when the child has this history that the mother is likely to have retinoblastoma, we already know that the child who presented to our clinic with leukocoria is most likely retinoblastoma. So once we do, a, once we take a history, the appropriate history and do a preliminary examination, the step two for confirmation of diagnosis is to do ultrasonography. Like, uh, for example, now the first child uh, does not have good, uh, well-defined intraocular mass. So this was, in fact, a case of retinopathy of prematurity and not retinoblastoma. 
the second child had retinal detachment and some thickening that was noted. And this child had retinal dysplasia with retinal detachment and not retinoblastoma. The third child had uh, total retinal detachment with some echoes that were noted. And this child, in fact, had Coates disease, which was mimicking retinoblastoma clinically. The fourth child here again, the scan showed that there were some opacities in the vitreous. And this child also had uh, features in the other eye. And this child, um, in fact, had familial exudative vitreal retinopathy and not retinoblastoma. This child, the fifth picture, the child had an anterior mass. And this uh, child, in fact, had meduloepithelioma, which again is a very close mimicker of retinoblastoma. The last uh, picture, this child who had a history of trauma on ultrasonography showed that the child also had retinal detachment. So this was, in fact, just a simple case of cataract with retinal detachment and not retinoblastoma. So once we make this diagnosis, we certainly have to know what a classic retinoblastoma ultrasonography looks like. So this is what it looks like. So the B scan shows a well-defined intraocular mass. There will be areas of hyperechogenicity with uh, acoustic shadowing, which is marked in green arrows there, with corresponding high spikes on A scan, which is suggestive of calcification, which are marked in red arrows here. And next step, the step three to confirm the diagnosis is to do an orbital imaging. Now, this not only helps to confirm the diagnosis, but also to detect if there is extension of the tumor beyond the eye into the optic nerve, or if there is extraocular tumor extension or intracranial tumor extension, or sometimes the child uh, can have a trilateral retinoblastoma with a pinealoblastoma as well. So MRI is um, the, uh, the modality of uh, choice where uh, the tumor can be seen as hypo-intense to vitreous on T1 and slightly hyper-intense to vitreous on T2, and calcification is seen as hypo-intense uh, foci and there will be moderate to marked uh, enhancement uh, with contrast injection. Now, it should be remembered that CT scan is best avoided in cases of retinoblastoma because it increases the predisposition for second primary malignancies. Now, step four to confirm the diagnosis is examination under anesthesia. So this is uh, first to confirm the diagnosis, to classify the tumor, and also to perform the initial focal treatment as well. Like, for example, this is a classic case of retinoblastoma where we see a yellowish white retinal mass. It will have these feeder vessels which will be dilated, tortuous, and dipping into the tumor, and there will be areas of intrinsic vascularity. It can also have subretinal seats, which are marked in orange here, and associated subretinal fluid as well, indicating that the tumor is very active. And sometimes they can also have what we call as the vitreous seeds, which are marked in green in this picture. Now, once we uh, confirm the diagnosis, we always document the findings with fundus drawings and also by fundus photography. Next, we classify the tumor and there are various classification systems like here, the International Classification of Retinoblastoma um, and the other classification which was proposed by Murphy et al., uh, for example, now this small tumor, which is uh, less than three millimeters in size, this would be grouped as group A. If it is more than three millimeters in size, group B. If it is associated with focal subretinal seeds, it would be group C. If it is associated with diffuse uh, vitreous or subretinal seeds, it would be group D. And if it is a large tumor with uh, features like associated hemorrhage, etc., it would be a group E tumor. And there are other um, conditions, other ways that the children present where they can be grouped as group E, like with tumor pseudohypopion as seen in this picture, or if the child has neovascularization of the iris or the neovascular glaucoma, presence with orbital pseudocellulitis, or presence with thysis bulbi. So all these, again, get grouped into group E. Sometimes the children can present with extraocular uh, extension of the tumor, where we use the International Retinoblastoma Staging System, which was proposed by Shantara et al. Now, next, moving to the initial management that is done uh, with an ophthalmologist or an ocular oncologist, is there are various modalities of treatment that are available, focal treatment, including cryotherapy, transpupillary thermotherapy, and argon laser photocoagulation. Chemotherapy, which can be in various forms like the intravenous, intraarterial, periocular, intravitreal, and the very recent intracameral chemotherapy. Radiotherapy is offered in the form of plaque radiotherapy or the external beam radiotherapy. And when the tumor is very advanced, then the child may require enucleation. For example, if we see such a picture in the clinic, 
then the one, the lesion which is in the posterior pole will be treated with transpupillary thermotherapy. And the lesion which is present in the periphery would be treated with cryotherapy. And look at what happens after treatment. So you can see that the tumors become flat scars. And this child would not even require uh, any chemotherapy, just the focal treatment is sufficient. But if uh, we see a child with such a large tumor, then obviously we have to go for chemotherapy. It could be intravenous chemotherapy or if available, intra-arterial chemotherapy again is a good choice for such an eye. And this is what uh, happens when we give chemotherapy, when the tumor completely regresses into a type 1 regression. Sometimes we can have very, very advanced tumor like this, where there is solid tumor, subretinal seeds, and vitreous seeds. And we have to use multiple modalities of treatment. For example, in this eye, we did intra-arterial chemotherapy, transpupillary thermotherapy, cryotherapy, and intravitreal chemotherapy. And with the combination of all these treatments, you can see that the tumor completely regressed. And this child has now completed five years of follow-up and still keeps the eye with reasonable vision. Now, uh, the recent modality of treatment that we have is when the vitreous seeds are present, we can give the uh, intrav uh, intravitreal chemotherapy. And this, uh, you can see that with intravitreal chemotherapy, the seeds completely disappear. And sometimes where there is focal tumor like this, which is marked in red, we do plaque radiotherapy, and again, with plaque radiotherapy, the tumor nicely regresses. But when the child presents with such advanced tumor, these eyes have to be enucleated to save the life. And when we see extraocular tumor extension like this, we do not go for enucleation or exenteration, but we choose to give chemotherapy. And you can see that after chemotherapy, the globe becomes very small, thysical, where we can go ahead and enucleate the eye and then irradiate the orbit uh, such as uh, to take care of the tumor. Coming to the last uh, part that is referral, this is the last slide that I have. So it is a retinoblastoma management. Certainly it is a team-based approach that we have to take. So the most of the times the children, they reach to the pediatrician or physician or sometimes the parents notice that there is some alteration in the red pupillary reflex or the child has strabismus. And then whenever such um, symptoms are seen, they should be referred to an ophthalmologist. At an ophthalmology center, at least the basic investigations like ultrasonography, if possible, MRI orbits and a basic fundus evaluation sh should be done by the ophthalmologist. And if there is suspicion of retinoblastoma, the child should definitely be sent to an ocular oncologist where a thorough examination will be done, the tumor will be classified and focal treatment will be given. And the oncologist further refers the patient to medical oncologist when intravenous chemotherapy uh, is required to an interventional neuroradiologist if an intra-arterial chemotherapy is required, to radiation oncologist if radiotherapy is required, to an ocularist if the eye is enucleated and if the child requires customized ocular prosthesis, and other services like rehabilitation services or um, even um, the genetic counseling, all these also have to be done. So it is a team-based approach that we have to take for treatment of retinoblastoma. And with this team-based approach, all of us can ensure that no child will die of retinoblastoma. Thank you very much uh, for patient hearing. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Swati, for this excellent presentation. Thank you. Wonderful. Now I would like to please invite our panelist, uh, Dr. Guillermo Chandahada is our SIOP president. He's a pediatric oncologist with a specialty in retinoblastoma and neuroblastoma from Buenos Aires, Argentina, with work also in Spain and Uruguay. Also, Dr. Regine Kabudi, our SIOP Secretary General-Elect. Uh, she is a professor in pediatric hematology oncology and chair of the Department of Preventive Oncology at the Istanbul uh, University Oncology Institute in Istanbul, Turkey. Additionally, Dr. Francois Dos, the SIOP past chair of the scientific committee. He's a professor of pediatrics at Paris Descartes University, pediatric oncologist, deputy director of clinical research, innovation, and teaching in the Cerredo Oncology Center at the Curie Institute and director of teaching at the Ensemble Hospital of the Curie Institute in Paris, France. And lastly, Dr. Sandra 
Stavieri Research Fellow at SARA and this retinoblastoma care coordinator, senior clinical um, uh, ortho, uh, ophthalmologist at Royal Children's Hospital in Vic Victoria, Australia. Each panelist will have approximately two and a half uh, minutes uh, to share their thoughts. And Dr. Guillermo uh, Chantara, I'd like to start with you. Thank you. Thank you very much. These were really great presentations. I think um, they both dealt with um, this issue that uh, we usually find the children when they present, they look well. So it's sometimes the family goes back home saying, well, the child doesn't have any, any major complaint. And then uh, then come back again and and again and again. So this is just uh, I know that many pediatricians, general pediatricians, are today in the audience. Uh, it is important, as been said by Clarissa and Swati, that these symptoms have to be taken seriously. The the children come. Uh, the the parents would say that the, the strabismus. They will probably notice uh, a white reflex. Sometimes now the the digital photographs are very important. So it is very important that the child should be referred to an ophthalmologist. Even if you don't find anything in the in the physical examination, you would go with your with your light. You will probably see that the child is fine. It looks fine. But still, please still refer the child to an ophthalmologist. And, and the ophthalmologist, one, they, once they receive the child, should perform an examination under anesthesia and uh, be sure that the child doesn't have retinoblastoma. So I think this is a very strong message uh, today for, for the audience. And, um, and I really thank the, the speakers for, for being so clear on that. And, and, and thank you very much again. Wonderful. Uh, Dr. Kabudi, your thoughts? Thank you very much, dear moderators and dear participants. First of all, thanks to all the presenters who have really pointed, emphasized all that we have to. Uh, Leukocoria and strabismus is very important, a message to all pediatricians that we have to, all to pediatricians and family physicians. So when we see a newborn or a young a child, we have always to look at the eyes to do the red reflex, and also if there is strabismus, because usually in medicine, we were thought when we were resident that it, during the first six months, we could have strabismus, but it's not the case. We have even diagnosed a child with retinoblastoma because of strabismus at 15 days. So it is very important. And early diagnosis is important to save the life and to save the vision. So first we want to save the life, but we also want to save the eye, the vision as well. And Turkey is a middle-income country. And within the last 30 years, we have advocated and witnessed all these developments in retinoblastoma. And we have, info, in fact, documented that. Like we were seeing more extraocular, where the, at that time the uh, survival is even low, but in the 80s. And in the 90s, it went more to intraocular. And nowadays, we see more intraocular, except the refugees and the uh, children that come from other countries around Turkey. So this was, in, uh, we have seen that. Second, in the intraocular, we saw more D and E eyes, that's advanced eyes, where you cannot save the eye. We had about 60% of those before 2000. And now it has gone a little oh, oh, to 50%. 50 and it's going a little uh, less. So it's important to, if you can uh, make an early diagnosis, you can save the life, but the vision as well. So what can we do for that? Education is very important. Education in the university for both physicians during the medical education, for both physicians and in the nursing schools, the early signs and symptoms of cancer and also of retinoblastoma. Very briefly, this is very important. And after that, the continued medical education is also important. Increasing awareness, both for health uh, staff and also for the community is very important. Like Clarissa had said, the celebrities sometimes when they have the child, the social media is very important. The television is very important. We can have some public awareness uh, announcements in the televisions, for example. Universal health coverage is very important. You can uh, have the early diagnosis, but the a uh, family has to take them to a doctor without uh, spending out-of-pocket money. So universal health coverage is very important, and the collaboration of the health with the national health authorities on these is very important. And then the team management, as 
has been uh, presented by our presenters because it is a very you need a very good ophthalmologist and a pediatric oncologist at least in the uh, in that team and also the other staff but a uh, dedicated ophthalmologist and with with that team you can do that and in the in all countries the ones that the ophthalmologists there are a few that are really dedicated to retinoblastoma that's enough because we can send them to tertiary centers when we detect them so early diagnosis is important to save the life, to save the vision. That's the message. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Um, Dr. Francois, your, uh, your thoughts, please. Yes, thank you. Also, I would like to congratulate the three speakers and my co-panelists. Um, uh, I think all presentations have been very clear. I will be short in my comments because I would like to have some time for questions from the from the room. Uh, I, I would just remind that uh, retinoblastoma is one of the six pediatric cancer which is in a WHO priorities because it's highly curable. So although most of the patients with retinoblastoma in the world die of their disease because in the low-income countries, uh, the, the mortality rate is very high. However, this is a highly curable disease. So we should be aware of these early symptoms. And uh, when uh, the diagnosis is missed, uh, uh, then there is a huge responsibility because the risk of dying of the disease is high. And I think also the role of parents' association in the in these diseases are very important to mobilize the uh, politicians and to try to uh, facilitate everything for early diagnosis and treatment. Then after the presentation, we could discuss about uh, staging modalities, treatment modalities, including the role of radiotherapy today and the modality of surgery. But I think we will keep those questions for the discussion later on. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, Dr. Staffieri, your thoughts, please. Thanks very much, Erin. Um, yes, look, I would just like to um, finish with saying how wonderful the presentations were. But I guess as an orthoptist, I'm thinking of this more from an ophthalmic perspective in that any awareness campaign could perhaps encapsulate all paediatric eye disease as um, Dr. Swathi outlined that leukocoria can indicate many other eye diseases. And if we take the approach of screening for many different eye diseases, we will pick up the retinoblastoma along with cataract. The WHO has a very strong program um, and um, commitment to screening children for cataract, congenital, congenital cataract, which is the leading cause of childhood blindness. Um, and Cataract presents with leukocoria in much the same way as retinoblastoma does. So perhaps if we shift our thinking to fishing with a net rather than with a line, um, I believe that many, many people feel that retinoblastoma is a little bit too rare to care, but I don't think that is the case. And um, we know that awareness works. This was demonstrated very clearly by Leander and colleagues um, in 2007 and showed very clearly that just simply putting a poster in a community centre where parents attend for vaccination got that message out that leukocoria was not normal and that they needed to seek advice. And when we educate the community with posters, we educate the health workers at the same time. Lots of work to do. It's, um, it, it's quite an irony, really, that we have come so many decades down the track and we perhaps haven't quite got the awareness out there that we think we need for retinoblastoma, but we can fix this problem. Thank you. Thank you very much. And to all of our panelists for those excellent and astute comments. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. So uh, Julia and I will uh, forward the questions now. And uh, I think maybe we can, there's one question from Michelle Farmer. Uh, that any of the panelists can answer, are, which is very important. Are tools and guidance documents available for clinical teams working in rural and in other low resource settings? It may be difficult to identify early presentation of retinoblastoma without some additional guidelines. So would anyone would like to answer that? Francois, maybe? <laughs> I think any uh, ophthalmology test book uh, should uh, include the description of early symptoms of retinoblastoma. I don't think there is ma many things to say. Now, the screening programs have been uh, 
not always successful according to the countries. It's not so easy. But um, I am not aware of uh, published guidelines for early diagnosis, uh, but maybe uh, other panelists may complement. Okay, thank you. Uh, Julia, would you like to go on? Sure. <clears throat> Did anybody else on the panel have a suggestion for rural guidelines or low resource settings? Uh, I, agree with, I agree with Francois. The, it is uh, just a matter of uh, examining the child. It's, uh, it, it's really, there's nothing special. It's really easy to make the diagnosis. You have to suspect it. That's the issue. Uh, if you don't suspect it, you don't diagnose it. But if you suspect it, it's really uh, not so difficult. You, it's not a, the, a guideline that we might use. It's just, uh, I think, but my my uh, opinion is just a matter of uh, having the suspicion, thinking that that could be what the patient has. Perfect. Thank you so much. I'm going to go now to a question from uh, Mohammed Yanuar Amal. He thanks for the great presentation. He asks, would you choose MRI or fundoscopy or even both for evaluation of retinoblastoma after treatment? Since in my experience, we usually have it hard to see small lesions on MRI, even though the radiologist uses high resolution MRI. I, I would say, uh, if I may, that uh, for intraocular retinoblastoma, the best exam is the ocular exam from the ophthalmologist. That's for sure. Then when there is a, a tumor uh, in front of the optic nerve, uh, or the ocular fundus, then MRI may be useful also for follow-up. But in most of the cases for intraocular retinoblastoma, the follow-up is uh, clinical. I do support what Francois says. In case of uh, trilateral, where you have another uh, tumor in the brain, then we would probably go with the MRI, but otherwise in the interocular, unilateral, bilateral, uh, the ocular investigation would be enough. I think the ophthalmologist would agree with us, right? We have two ophthalmologists with us. Yes. Okay. Yes, I was about to say the same. Uh, we as oncologists should not follow the patient's intraocular lesions. Uh, it is uh, the ophthalmologist that are um, doing that job. We have to follow the children for um, extraocular dissemination, but everything that is in the in the eye should be, there's no replacement for the ophthalmologist follow-up. The children should be followed by an ophthalmologist. Okay, thank you. So there's another question for Michelle Farmer, uh, and she thanks for these presentations. Uh, and. What types of follow-up is recommended for children with retinoblastoma? I mean, how can the primary care team support the family to ensure these children are not lost to follow-up, which is very important, of course. Would any of the panelists or speakers would like to uh, answer? So do we have these uh, guidelines for the primary uh, care team as well, Regine? Yes, we do have them. And I think uh, either Clarissa or uh, Dr. Kaliki had in her presentation a nice uh, slide on that, that in patients according to their age, uh, how the ophthalmologic uh, examination, the follow-up should be. Like if, if the age, because especially in bilateral cases uh, and in genetic cases, the risk of uh, having a new tumor is so high that the ocular investigation should be done very closely, especially at that time. So I think this depends on the age and also on the whether it's bilateral, whether it's unilateral, and if you have done the genetics, what is it, whether it is genetics. And there are these guidelines. Maybe our ophthalmologist friends would probably uh, want to say a word about it. I think Sandra wants to say something about it or one of our ophthalmologists? Yes. Sandra? Yes. Yes, they are the, the guidelines um, uh, by Scalet and co-workers, which were published a couple of years ago, um, and many centres use this as a, it, it's a consensus document um, that uh, examined the different um, 
as, as you as you pointed out, the different age and whether genetics has been done. And the genetics has to be fully informative as well um, to be able to use these guidelines. Otherwise, we revert back to pre-genetic testing um, assessment because it would be a great tragedy to um, not detect familial retinoblastoma at a time when you are still able to treat with focal um, treatment alone and avoid chemotherapy altogether and certainly enucleation. Also, Sandra, because many if people from low and middle income countries are listening to us, some many of these countries cannot do right away genetic tests. So it will be very important to also uh, emphasize that when, even if you have a unilateral retinoblastoma, most of the time, 80% they would not be hereditary, but 20% they can be hereditary. So if there is another child in the uh, family or if the fa family wants another child, the genetic, even if you cannot do the genetic testing, uh, telling of the risks of the other child is very important in that family. This is very true. Absolutely, it's true. Um, some work done by the um, the team in Denmark at Aarhus University recently retrospectively tested adult survivors of unilateral retinoblastoma, and they had a rate as high as 24% of um, people found to have germline mutation, so heritable retinoblastoma in the setting of unilateral disease. So it is quite significant and definitely worth screening these children regularly until they're five, five years of age. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Uh, so uh, I think we are running out of time. It was an excellent uh, meeting. And uh, as Julia has said in the beginning, if the participants, uh, so there are some unanswered questions, but they can uh, later on uh, send them uh, by email and then uh, people will uh, uh, answer them. I mean, the colleagues will answer them. So just to conclude uh, before, Erin, uh, would you like to uh, about uh, announce of about- Of course. Yes, okay, and then yes. I will, okay. Thank you very much. Um, so yes, just a couple of announcements. Um, so thank you to all of our attendees today, in addition to our wonderful speakers and panelists. Um, the SIOP office will send around a post-webinar survey. This will also have the link for the continuing medical education credit. And I also want to uh, remind you or make you aware that um, these uh, uh, webinars have been recorded and are posted on our SIOP YouTube page. So if you were unable to join us for our first two webinars, which focus on outcomes of childhood cancers, gaps and disparities to be addressed, and diagnosis and referral of acute leukemia, uh, you are able to access those recordings on our PSYOP YouTube page. Additionally, I'd like to invite you to our next webinar, which will take place on Friday, December 16th, 2 to 3 p.m. UTC, uh, which will focus on the diagnosis and referral of brain tumor. So we hope that you will join us again. Thank you for your time. Okay, so just for the concluding remarks. So dear colleagues, uh, I hope and I believe that it has been a fruitful meeting for all of us, uh, you know, sharing knowledge and experience with all the experts in the field. Well, the most important message is actually early diagnosis. So, the, so we do uh, get a better prognosis so screening is very important, but we know that there is a gap between the countries. Uh, so what we have to achieve, actually, uh, we have to increase awareness, which is very important, as the speakers have uh, mentioned, and uh, more targeted uh, health care policies. For example, I think this primary care team, for example, would be excellent to work with, actually. Uh, and of course, uh, it's very important. This is for uh, true. This should be true for all children in the world, so that they good they have an access to early diagnosis and uh, early treatment. And I think we also have to put more emphasis actually on preventive medicine in the curriculum of our uh, medical uh, faculties because this is important actually. 
uh, among with others. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you to all the uh, speakers, uh, the panelists, and to all the participants and who have discussed. Thank you. See you in another webinar. Bye-bye.